The long, dark night. The breathing in the silence. The voice in the storm. You are present in all things, in all times. You saw us in our mother's wombs. You watched us as children dance in the rain. And God, you tell us not to harvest the entire field. Leave the corners. Leave what grows in the corners for the widows, the strangers, the poor. We cannot shut each other out, God. We are your children. There are too many who wait in the corners for help, too long ignored, too long forgotten, too long alone. We will leave what grows in the corners for them, God. We will do this because we know what it's like to be in the corners and feel forgotten. Life is too precious, God. Life is a song we should dance to. Life is the embrace of a loved one. Help us see your son when we look at each other. Help us be the hand up to those who have fallen. Help us be the calming voice to the loudest mind. None get ignored here, God. No one stays in the corners. Everyone is welcome at your table, Lord. Every last life, sacred. Amen. You seem hesitant. I think that's worth clapping over. Do you think that's worth clapping over? It's an important message, so it's the third Sunday of January, and I don't do a whole lot of, uh, I hate to say gimmicky things, but there are, there are different things that come up. Sanctity of Human Life Sunday is one of those. It, it's a great thing, and a lot of times, uh, just my personality, my perception is, is, is I'd rather be in God's Word than, and, and, you know, than promote maybe something else. But uh, I think it's fitting that we stop and, and maybe consider for a few moments some of the things we heard in that video. That all life is what? All life is sacred. It's precious. It's, it's valuable, right? And, and so a lot of times we think about this, this particular Sunday and this time is you to talk about things like abortion and, and that is a great evil and we should speak against it. Uh, you know, I could stand up here and talk to you about Things like foster care and adoption, uh, which is uh, you know my my passion and, and mine and Kimmy's passion. And the truth is, and you heard the video. And the reason I want to show this video is is I make an interesting point that it's not just the unborn, it's not just lives we don't see or know. It's the people sitting right next to you in your pew. It's your neighbors. It's the people at work. Uh, it's the people who don't look like you. It's the people who are younger than you and older than you. God calls us to value every human life because we're all made in the image of God. Amen. Uh, and so this year we kind of set for ourselves uh, so some goals and some ideas and some visions. And one of those is service. And as we go through this year and we serve each other, I think that's a great reminder. And perhaps you'll, you'll see this video again throughout the year that as we go out and we serve one another, we do it because we're called to love one another, right? Uh, you know, reference the Old Testament tradition of not harvesting all the corners you leave that so people can come behind you, the ones that don't have and they can take that and they can, you know, they, they can provide for themselves or you can help them provide for themselves and, and give them something. And uh, we should still be about stuff like that, finding opportunities to love people and serve people and give freely to them. So uh, here's what I'd like to do before we dismiss for Children's Church. I'd like to, if you're sitting by maybe a family member or, or someone you, 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 you feel comfortable enough, just maybe reach over and grab their hand. And I want to pray and I want you to pray with me. Uh, just have the Lord uh, uh, lead us in serving, loving, and recognizing our opportunities uh, to value life as he values life. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. And again, I thank you for this place, for these people, and uh, for their willingness, Father, to even listen to the short video, reach over, grab a hand. Father, I pray that for all of us in this room, uh, Father, that we would, we would value life as you value life. Father, you love us desperately, uh, and not just us. And again, not just people who look like us or think like us or believe like us. Father, every single person on this planet was made in your image, and you have a desire for them to know you and, uh, and, and belong to you and, and to spend eternity with you, Father. I pray we would keep that in perspective, uh, that as we go amongst our day, Father, the people we interact with, those are people that you've given us uh, to be examples to, to invest in, uh, to love and to serve. And Father, may we uh, see all life as sacred. Father, again, I pray that you would give us opportunities, guide us in the ways that you'd have us to go and the people you'd have us to meet. We love you. We thank you. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll dismiss children's the children's church back there. That's for ages four through fifth grade. We have some some of our elder youth boys that are stepping up. There is an adult back there, so don't worry. But uh, 
they have come to me and asked if they could teach children's church. Thought that was uh, thought that was good. I'm, I'm, I was I was inspired by that. Uh, they're still alive after last week. They enjoyed it, so they're going to do it again this week. So encourage those young people as they are already teaching the next generation. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. So we are going to embark on something new this morning. Uh, you see behind me there. We are going to start talking about parables, right? And so you've probably heard this word parable before. How many of you guys are familiar with, with parables? Okay, I'm going to make you be interactive this morning. I think it'll be good for us. So it'll get, it'll, get, it'll get the blood flowing, right? And so we've probably heard this term before. Maybe we've heard some parables before. Uh, and, and thinking about where the Lord would have us go next, and we wrapped up the hashtag series, and we, you know, we talked about some leadership stuff, did some stuff over Christmas and New Year's. And so thinking about uh, where we were going to go next, last week we had, uh, we had Phil come in and talk about stewardship and some of the thriving things. And, and so my goal was to continue on with some stewardship stuff was praying about what that looked like, where that might go. Uh, some, some parables came to mind. And so the original goal for this morning was to talk about stewardship, maybe use a couple of parables in the midst of that. But as I was going back through some, some old notes, right, because my, my, my life consists of old yellow notepads and sticky notes, I realized that once upon a time uh, I had felt impressed to do a series on parables, right? And I'd read a couple of books about parables, and I really enjoy parables, and, and you'll, you'll find out why here in a minute. But I thought, well, this might be a good time to revisit that. So we begin to look into it. And sure enough, right, that seems to be the avenue that God's taken us. And we're not actually going to jump into a parable yet, although we'll hear at least one this morning. But I want to take time to kind of introduce parables this morning. There's a couple of key words that will come up. And this is why I'm going to share with you. And I think maybe hopefully we'll enjoy a brief introduction. But I want to talk this morning about kind of what parables are. All right, maybe their, their purpose uh, and why they should be important to us. And again, some keywords will come up uh, that I think you'll identify with as well. But when you think about parables, most of us probably understand that parables are like stories, right? But, but parables also have a purpose. They're stories that are trying to teach us something. And I begin to think about you know, why would Jesus come and why would Jesus speak in parables? They're littered all throughout the Gospels, except for one. There's one Gospel that doesn't have parables. Anyone know which Gospel that is? A little, little Bible trivia for you this morning, right? Maybe this will be on Final Jeopardy one day. So the Gospel of John does not have any parables in it, right? And most of the parables that we're going to find are going to be in Matthew and Luke, and there's quite an extensive amount of them, right? And, and they're shared with Jesus' audience, but also for us uh, for a purpose. These, these stories are going to be simple, yet they're going to have a purpose, and they're going to attempt to describe something. To us. So almost in every situation, it's an opportunity for us to learn. So no matter how many times you've heard these particular parables, or maybe you've done parables, maybe you've colored the coloring sheets in, in Sunday school and you've done all that stuff, there's going to be something new for us to learn. So we need to think about teaching and learning and all those good kind of things. So I try to think of an example for, for us this morning about why is it important for us to take something, make it simple, make it teachable, Right, and what maybe we could gain or, or, or yield from that. So I begin to think about what's kind of new and modern. I already mentioned the old cell phone. How many of you guys got a cell phone? Right? But look, Hilltop says we are live. Whew. Information at the speed of life right there. And so I begin to think about if you had something like a smartphone, right? And, and then you were to take that smartphone and, and let's just say for fun, we'll put our imagination caps on this morning, uh, you were to go back in time. Right? Uh, let's say you go back in time, 150, 200 years, something like that. Right? Maybe that's going to be the new you know, tourist thing in, uh, in the future. We all get to go back in time. Let's say you go back in time, you take that smartphone with you. Then you've been given a task, 150 years in the past, that you have to explain to someone what that is. Right? Okay, and so there's some interesting dilemmas, isn't there, right? Because you go 150 years ago, you can't really use the word phone, okay? There is no internet or data, okay? Who are you going to call to explain that you can reach people at the other end? Well, you can't because there's no one there, right? So I could go 150 years ago, I could take my really cool piece of technology, something today that's really almost life-changing in a lot of ways, okay? It's important to us, we do a lot of things on this, okay, good and bad, Right? But if I go to a certain context, if I go to a certain group that doesn't have this knowledge, doesn't have this experience, 
right, who doesn't have the vocabulary or vernacular to understand what I'm saying, in order to explain this, I'm going to have to what? I'm going to have to make it simple. I'm going to have to find examples that, that they understand about how maybe how they communicate. And say, so, okay, well, this is how we communicate, you know. Okay, instead of, instead of the ink well and the parchment paper, right, I can type things on this device, right? And then this device runs my life for me and things like, you know, all that stuff. So being to think about maybe, you know, maybe that's not a perfect example. Being to think about, you know, our need possibly to explain something like that. To take something that's rather advanced and maybe uncommon to a group of people and try to get them to understand what it is and what it means. And then you go back to this idea of parables. Well, that's exactly what parables are attempting to do for us. Parables are stories that are meant to take something bring it into a, a, a more simple and concrete idea and then teach us and grow us in that so that we can kind of expand and, and keep walking in it. When we are trying to learn things about God, well, we're not God, right? Popular or, or contrary to someone's popular belief, right? We're not God. We don't have it all figured out. So to explain God and the character and nature of God, there needs to be a device in a way to bring it to our level so we can understand it, right? And that's where we have this concept and this idea of parables, right? It's kind of like as Jesus is speaking to, to people, he's almost rolling out the old story time rug, right? You guys remember that? And gather around the story time rug and someone reads you a story. You guys, you guys remember that, anyone? I remember that's like some of the best memories from pre-K and kindergarten, right? Sit around the rug, listen to a story, learn a little lesson. And you know what? We still need that today. None of us have outgrown the spiritual story time rug. And so as God's word is kind of laid out for us in this simple manner, we ought to take it and receive it graciously and thankfully. Because it's going to be put in words that we can possibly understand, which is great for us. Because without it, we wouldn't know. And we wouldn't have the ability to know. And these are all things that we're going to talk about and lay out this morning. Again, we're going to go through some of why parables and what parables mean. And my, my, my hope is, as we go through this, that we'll go through as many parables as, as the Lord lays on our heart to go through. There's a lot of them out there, and I would like to spend uh, quite a bit of time, if possible, going through this. So let's talk a little bit more about parables. So again, we have that idea that if you have to take something like a phone right? Go back in time. Maybe you get dropped off on a remote island. No one's ever seen technology. If you had the daunting task of explaining this abstract concept, this advanced piece of technology to someone who's never seen it, never used it, you would have to find a simple story, a simple relatable language, right? For them to understand what you're talking about and why it's even important to them, right? But you got to be careful. You do this, AT&T will be calling them, selling them products, and we don't want that. So, we're not going to teach too many people about it. Here's my AT&T dig. We're, we're getting rid of AT&T, by the way, so praise God. All right, so let's talk about some of these parables. Why parables, right? That's kind of maybe the concept for this morning is, is why parables are important to us, what they mean, you know, right? and, and hopefully some of the things we'll get out of this series as we go through it together. And so the first thing I want to talk about real quick here is, is that parables use simple words to teach profound spiritual lessons, right? And we like these words, simple, okay? How many of you relate to that? I said, there's a reason that, that I like parables, right? And this is probably one of the main words is that they're, they're simple. Sometimes we read scripture and we're like, I have no idea what that means. I've talked to people before that said, you know what, if I don't understand something in scripture, I just keep reading. And I figure one day maybe I'll understand it. Well, I mean, that could be a hard way to go through, to, through the Bible, and so maybe if you have a hard time understanding some of these concepts, well, let's go to some parables. Let's go to some things that are purposely made simple, but hold extremely valuable spiritual insights, right? And, and so here's an example, Matthew 13, 33, right? There's another parable he spoke to them. This is Jesus speaking. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. The end. Good story. Okay? In the original Greek, this parable is 19 words long. Short. Simple. 
to the point. And this is good. This is, this, is, this is what we need, right? We like to complicate things, don't we? And to be fair, sometimes life is complicated. But as Jesus is speaking, he's going to give them a 19-word parable that's going to teach them a, a, a spiritual truth about the kingdom of heaven, right? And therefore, about God and God's character and his nature, right? Now, we said it's not complicated, but as I just told you, what's the topic of this particular parable? Well, he says, the kingdom of heaven, okay? Simple parable, yet the topic is the kingdom of heaven, which seems to be fairly complicated and abstract. It's like if I got up here and said, hey, we're going to take just a short time and explain the U.S. tax code, <laughs> right, in 30 minutes or less, okay, and we'd be really impressed, right? Or, or maybe I said, hey, we're going to have, we're going to have a five-minute conversation about quantum physics. You guys ready? And then we're like, no, please, Lord, no, right? Or, or maybe I get up here and I said, listen, Women are like, in a 19 words or less, I perfectly describe women. Wouldn't that be like a miracle from, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, my wife's not here, so I threw that one in. Uh, she's probably watching on live stream, so I, I love you. All right. Uh, okay. But if you think about that, 19 words, short parable, but it starts off, the kingdom of heaven is like, and the kingdom of heaven, whew, I mean, remember, he's talking to mostly Jewish audience here, and they've been raised on, you know, the kingdom of heaven, then the Messiah, and, and the law, and the prophets, and all these things. These people are waiting for that. They, they want to see it. They want to know it. Up until this point, they don't know it. Up until this point, no one's been able to tell them or show them or really describe what's happening with that. Okay? It, it's almost been kept from them, from the, from the Pharisees and the scribes and all those people. Jesus says, here, I'm going I'm to give you a simple nugget of truth. Here it is. Right? And again, these people are hungry for it. They're desperate for it. And, 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 and we should be too. And so we should be excited when we come to things like this to go, oh, we're, we're about to get this really low-hanging fruit, this, this nugget of wisdom, right? And we should get excited for this. Now, now what's the lesson in this particular one? Well, again, we're going we're to keep it simple. Right? The kingdom of heaven is like, what's it say? Leaven. Right? Now, what's leaven? We don't use that word much. Yeast, okay? All right? And now, a lot of times, and we don't want to overcomplicate it, and, and I've read some commentaries to me, it way overcomplicates this. They go, well, you know, a lot of times in the Scripture, yeast is used to reference evil, and, and so they make this whole big overarching thing about how this is really talking about evil and all that. I, I don't think that's true, all right? I guess some other commentaries, other things I've read uh, that said, really, you've got to keep this in context and simple, the word here is simple, okay? How many of you guys have ever baked bread before? Okay, now this would probably make a little more sense to Jesus' audience at the time because you didn't go to the store and, and get Wonder Bread and go home and make it PB&J. Like, if you wanted bread, typically you, you got the grain and you, know, and you ground it up and you, you would make the dough and you would bake your bread. And so it would make sense to me because, listen, if you were making bread and you had dough and you added just a pinch of yeast in that, what's going to happen? Okay, it's going to rise. Why is it going to rise? Because you put that yeast in there, you put that bacteria in there, and it's going to begin to spread. It's going to permeate everything. You come back a little bit later, and you're going to notice it's going to go from a little lump of dough, and it's going to be all you know, expanded and risen and all that good stuff. Right? And so, so what is he trying to say, for one, about maybe just, just that, that bread, just the analogy? Well, it starts with kind of that single point. I put my pinch of yeast in there from that single point, that yeast is going to do what? It's going to spread. It's going to be moving. You may not see it. In fact, you know, unless you're just sitting there watching it, right, you may not really notice it. But that yeast is going to be working. You One little point, one little pinch, in it goes. Right? You give it a little bit of time, what's going to happen? That yeast is going to work its way all the way through that dough. Right? And, and what we're going to find out is that yeast is no respecter of dough. You put it in dough, it's going to go to work. All throughout the dough. So I can hit a port and go, well, we don't go there. We don't talk to those people. Right? It goes everywhere. Expands all through it. And when you come back, man, it says it, it's leavened the whole lump. All that dough has been infiltrated by that yeast, and that yeast has done its job. And remember, he says the kingdom of heaven is like. Okay? And so this is not a direct analogy. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a loaf of bread. 
No, he says, listen, the kingdom of heaven is like this event, this, this thing that you've witnessed over and over, maybe every day of your life when you've baked bread and you've seen this happen, and you haven't really thought of it in these terms, but the kingdom of heaven is like this, in that what? That, that it's going to start with this kind of a single, maybe unassuming point, or maybe in this case we could even say, man, as Jesus is there teaching them, right, and, and, and essentially his ministry is beginning the work of the gospel, Right? And he's going to go to the cross, he's going to die, he's going to be resurrected, right? and he's going to appear to people. He's going to initiate the going and the spreading of the gospel in the early church and all those things. But it starts right there with that one unassuming man. Which again, at the time, people said, well, Jesus, Jesus is this great teacher. Jesus is this, Jesus is that. But I don't think they really understood it. He goes, listen, it's kind of like you put that, that pinch of yeast in and maybe you don't really understand what's going on or maybe you don't really get it but but it starts with that one point right and, and then what happens if, if that yeast is like the gospel if the yeast is like the, the message of jesus christ it's going to spread and it's always at work has there ever been a time in this world in this creation that god has not been at work right no well we get in, in, in the beginning right and they said that god rested okay did that mean that god disengage? Does that mean that God wasn't uh, available? No. He's always been at work. Even at times where we're supposed to rest, there's still spiritual things going on. And so you think about, you know, he says, listen, that yeast goes in that one particular point and it changes everything. And, it, and it's always at work. And maybe even when you can't see it, you watch the news and then everything seems so sad and depressing, right? You think the world is coming to an end which kind of is, but you, know, you think, well, you know, where, where, where's God and what's going on? The truth is, it's at work, All right? And what's happening is the gospel is permeating every corner of this planet, All right? Is there any place the gospel can't go? Is there any people that the gospel is not made to reach? The answer to that's no, okay, in case, in case we're wondering, Okay. Is there anyone, any group, any people, any classified by gender, race, color, anything like that that says, oh, the gospel wasn't made for you? No, that gospel goes and it permeates. Just like it leavened the whole lump, it goes everywhere. And it's meant to go everywhere. And so he says, listen, the kingdom of heaven is like that, that yeast, it's like that dough, it's like that whole lump. Listen, something's happening. Even right now, as he's speaking, as Jesus is speaking to these people, it's happening. And it's going to keep happening and it's going to permeate and change the entire world. And if nothing else, that should give us some hope and encouragement. The gospel of Jesus Christ has been at work, is at work, and will continue to be at work. It goes everywhere, and it accomplishes its purposes. God has a plan. He knows what's going on. And for a group of people who've been disconnected from the things of God by their own spiritual leaders, for Jesus to say, listen, it's going and it's working, and that means you as well. You're a part of it. That's got to be some exciting news for them. And hopefully even for us today, it's still good and exciting news for us. That no matter where you're at in life, what station you find yourself in, the gospel is always at work. Right? The lump is being leavened, as it were. And Jesus says it's always going to be at work. It's always going to be moving. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Not distant, not disconnected, not for the elites, not for people who can figure it out on their own, right? The yeast has been put in the mix. It's working its way through, and it's going to permeate everything and everyone, right? 19 words. The kingdom of heaven is like, and there's an encouragement for people who are desperate to know that there is a God that loves them and that they can know. Wouldn't that be good news? If you had never heard that before, wouldn't you be just a little bit excited for someone to say, listen, the God of the universe is at work in and around you? Okay, a couple of you guys, all right, all right. But it's true. It's a simple story. It's meant to be a simple story. Now, it doesn't give us the full picture, right? And, and I've expounded on it more than obviously Jesus did here. He throws it out there and he lets their minds work through it. Okay, I remember when I baked that bread and I did that thing, and okay, it makes kind of sense. I see that now. It's a simple story for the, for the listener to hear, right, and begin to contemplate and understand and wrap their minds around complex spiritual 
truths. And it's, yes. Question from the audience, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. I, I, I'm going to wait. I'll, I'll be honest. I don't do a lot of baking. Now, I know the process of yeast, but to stand up here and go, well, yesterday when I was baking bread, and then, no, like I couldn't tell you last time I baked anything, I had put yeast in it, right? Uh, and I think you make a great point, because you're right, the parable right before that, we didn't read it. It's about the faith of a mustard seed. You guys know the mustard seeds are very, very small, yet when they're planted and they sprout and they grow, they produce a fairly good size plant, right? And so he says, listen, it's, again, it's another parable, it's a story. And if you're tending a garden, if you're someone who's outdoors and you understand means to cultivate the ground and grow something, you can understand that a very small seed can grow something quite large, right? Absolutely. And the, and the kingdom of heaven is like, right, people who, who, listen, you put that ounce of faith in, right, you understand again that there's a God who loves you and knows you, then what can happen in your life, what can happen in that kingdom, what can happen in the world is something amazing. Same thing with the yeast and the dough. Right? Absolutely. And what we're going to find is that the parables, they don't live in a vacuum. They all play off each other. Christ isn't going one place and telling one story, then going another place and telling something that's completely different with a different outcome. All these are going to play off each other with the same story of redemption and the same story of, of the God that, that wants, wants us to know that he knows us and loves, loves us. Right? It's going to always be leading us to that same conclusion, which is the conclusion of the gospel. Excellent point. Excellent question. See, you should have said that. I'm glad you said it, right? Uh, and so when we go through here, and again, that's, that's, the, that's the parable. That's the word speaking to us, right? That's the word taking something simple, but teaching something, again, spiritually profound. And that's what we need. Again, I don't know about you, but when we come to that word simple, that's me. I'm a pretty simple person. And I would rather be told simply what it is than to be given some complex explanation that I can't grasp. Right? And so I'm thankful for things like parables. I'm not thankful that we're already catching on to those things. Again, maybe you've read these things. Maybe you know all this. Maybe this is just a good reminder. But to take something simple like the story of the mustard seed, the story uh, of the dough, but to understand the deep and far-reaching implications it has for us spiritually, it's huge. And, th and that was the point, and that's the purpose of these parables. And again, as we go through it through this series, I hope that you'll understand these things as well. So, Simple, right? Simple stories, but profound spiritual lessons. And here's something else about parables. They kind of have a dual nature, right? So parables are going to both hide and reveal truth, okay? Don't we love those kind of things that seem to be stereotypical, right? The oxymorons and we like, have the ends of the spectrums and all those different things. Well, here we have parables, even though they're simple, right? Even though they want to give us these spiritual truths, we're going to find that parables and the teaching of Jesus will hide truth and reveal truth, sometimes at the exact same time, all depending on the audience, right? And so still in the book of Matthew, if you want to flip with me, you can go to Matthew chapter 11, but I'm going to read a, uh, a quick verse here that kind of gives this, this understanding. Matthew eleven twenty five. 25 says, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent that have revealed them to babes. So what is he talking about? Right? And this isn't even specifically just parables, but this is the, the truth in the gospel and the words of Christ. And, and he's thanking God that he has hidden them from certain people, but revealed them to others. Right? Now, why would Jesus thank the Father for hiding things. 
Right? That, that seems a little nefarious. Well, you got to get some context. We go back to verse 20. Okay? It says, Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done. Because, what's it say there? Because they did not repent. And so what's been going on? Jesus has been going, he's been speaking, and he's been performing miracles, and he's been teaching. And in some of these cities where he's done the most magnificent things and, and said some of the most profound things and, and presented the gospel to people, what he has observed is that there's a large group of people who will hear a parable or see a work, and instead of seeing that simple thing and understanding that it represents a profound spiritual truth, and they go, I want that, or I'm going to absorb it, I'm going to chew on that, there are people, and this is mostly the self-righteous crowd that goes, well, I don't either I don't need that, or I already have that, or understand that, or that's beneath me, right? If I come up here and I'm talking about bacon bread, and you're like, I don't care about bread, and you just zoof, right? We're going to go over here, and we're going we're to tone you out and go do something else in our brains, right? And what Jesus is noticing is that he's speaking these truths to people. There are people from whom that truth is hidden. And not because they didn't want it and God said no, you know, or they did want it and God said no, you can't have it. It's because in their hearts they rejected it. Right? Again, either they were too far above it, they have their own righteousness, whatever that looks like. But basically their reception for the word of God was a rejection. Right? That's not what we're here for, that's not what we want. And we see that throughout scripture, that truth always divides. When, when truth is spoken, it's going to push you into one of two camps, right? You either reject it or you accept it. And again, same with parables. Even though it's a simple story that Christ is speaking for these spiritual truths to come across, there are people who will reject that simple story out of pride, again, self-righteousness, whatever that looks like. And so again, you either have people who will accept it, grow in it, and become wiser because of it, or you'll have people who will reject it, scoff, and usually just sink deeper into their self-righteousness. You know, we, we heard the example last week from Phil when he talked about the rich young ruler. And Jesus unloaded some truth on him. What did it say about him? It said he went away because, or how did he go away? He went away and he was very, he was very sad. Why was he sad? Because he had great possessions. I mean, he had an emotional response to the words of Christ, but the response was to reject it. Because that man accepting the words of Christ and accepting his call and invitation was to reject the things of the world, right? His wealth, position, power, authority, whatever that was, right? And he had to make that judgment, that truth cut him. But he found himself in the group that rejected it. We're going to go through some of these parables. We're going to find that in some of these parables, we're going to have reactions from, you know, Pharisees when they hear it. Most of the Pharisees, when they, when they hear these parables, how do they respond? They're, they're angry about it. They reject it. They go, you know, that's, that's nonsense. How, would, how can you possibly say the kingdom of heaven is like a lump of dough? That's ridiculous. That's, that's beneath, you know, whatever. Jesus says, no, I'm, I'm here to speak the simple truths so the simple can hear it and gain knowledge. So they reject it. We're going to see some things about scribes, same way. They're going to hear it and go, no, that can't possibly be true. They're going to try to correct the very God of the universe who authored truth about the truth that he's speaking. And we're going to see they reject. And we're also going to see people as they accept these words, right? It's revealed to them. And again, Jesus says, I thank you, Father, that as these simple words are spoken, that there are people ready and willing to receive them. And so, again, as we go through this, as we kind of prepare for this uh, kind of jaunt here, <coughs> excuse me, through, through parables, my hope is that every time we come together in his word, no matter how simple or how many times maybe you've heard a certain parable, you go, I am ready to receive something from the Word of God. Right? Again, you're going to hear some parables that, that if you've been in church any length of time, like I have, I grew up in this, right? I've colored the coloring sheets and I've done the connect the dots and I've done the flannel grams. Truth is, every time we come before the Word of God, there is something to be learned. Right? And there's something to be revealed to us. And so every time we come together, even though it may sound simple and familiar, be ready to, to have something revealed to you. Don't be the person that goes, I've already heard this, I don't need it. All right? Because we see that all through Scripture. People say, I don't, I don't need that, I don't want that. And so truth gets hidden from them and revealed to the ones who are ready and willing to accept it. 
And that's, again, kind of the interesting dual nature of the words of Christ and his parables as well, is that they're going to both, again, hide truth and reveal truth. And this last point, we'll wrap it up. Uh, and again, this is maybe kind of expands what we've talked about a little bit. But parables are going to utilize the concrete to reveal the abstract, right? Now, now, now what do I mean by that? I think there's, there's probably a pretty common question. It's a very serious question, but I think it's pretty pervasive inside of, of churches and Christianity is that people want to know who God is. You know, what's God about? Who is God? What is God? Get that question a lot. Have you ever watched, you know, people debate with, with atheists or, you know, share the gospel and someone says, well, you know, like, I believe there's a God, but a lot of the response I've heard before is, I believe there's a God, but I don't think we can know him, right? And that's like, like you know, being an agnostic. I'm not going to say there's not a God. I just don't know how to know him. You know, if God is God and I'm not God, where's the connection? And again, as we talk about parables, we talk about these simple stories and simple truths ready to be revealed to us. What we have to understand is that the words of Christ were given to us as something concrete that we can hold on to. And as we hold on to these words, what they're really doing for us and inside of us is they are explaining and showing to us what is abstract to us, something we can't understand our own, which is the character and nature of God. In Luke chapter 10, I didn't mark my pages, so I'm flipping here. Luke chapter 10, verses 23 and 24, Jesus has an amazing statement for his, his disciples. And hopefully it puts some perspective for them and for us as well about this truth that, we are, that we're privy to. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 23 and 24 says, And he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. And again, this is Jesus talking to his disciples. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. What is Jesus telling his disciples here? Listen, you are getting to see, hear, touch the, the, the very person of God. You're getting the words directly from God himself about who the Father is, about who Jesus the Messiah is, about who we are in him. It's a piece of the puzzle that people have desired for generations. Going back to says kings and prophets, you go back to the Old Testament. Right? I started my, my chronological Bible over this year. My goal is to read chronologically through the Bible. I've been reading through Genesis and all that. And you read about some of the things that go on and, and some of the things that these people said and did. And you're like, how come they, how come they behave like that? Did, didn't they know better? But then you think about they don't have the New Testament. They don't have the, the, the words of Christ. They don't have parables to read. It, it, there's a lot more mystery and a lot more kind of shadows for them about understanding the character and nature of God and who they are in Him. right? And, and, and they have faith, and that's credited to them for righteousness. But here's what Jesus is saying. Listen, you are being given things that people in the past only dreamed of. You are getting the words of God directly from the mouth of God. And that answers that question. In fact, the disciples answer, ask that same question uh, of Christ. John chapter 14. We have this conversation. Maybe you've had this conversation with him uh, as well. I've had several people, again, ask similar things. Uh, picking up in verse 8, right? John 14, 8 says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Right? He's just told them that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And Philip goes, well, hey, if you'll just show us the Father, then we'll, we'll see it and know it and we'll be all good. All right, now what's Jesus' response to that? Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? In the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. It says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So what does he say? What's the answer? He says, the things that I am doing and the things that I am saying, these are being done and these are being said so that you can know the Father. 
and they're being given to you as concrete evidence, things you can hold on to. If you've got a copy of this scripture, it's in your hand, the very word of God that reveals to us who God is. Right? Can you imagine having a service this morning and not having this book in your hand? Never having seen it, heard it, or known it. What would our service look like? It would be a little bit different. Think about going back to the Old Testament where you have, again, the kings and the prophets. Don't have the word of God in their hands. It's quite different. For us now, because of Christ coming and teaching and speaking and doing, we have concrete things to hold in our hands, the very word of God, to teach us about the very character and nature of God. So we can take something like the words in the parables, and we can take those and begin to understand and know what is abstract, what is beyond us, what is outside of us. Right? And so as we go through these parables, here is an opportunity for us to know more, more deeply and more intimately the person and the nature of God. Parables are important. Right? Parables are going to play a significant role in the teaching and ministry of Christ, and therefore it plays or should play a significant role in our understanding of him, the gospel, and of our Father. Amen? Are you with me? Does that make sense? We say that simple enough? It, but but it's, it's true, and I, and I hope again as we go through this and unpack some of these things, that they really do become more than just stories that we've heard before. Opportunities to, to know something so, so far beyond us, but put so simply that we can grasp it, right? Really, to me, it's quite amazing. So my hope is, again, as, as we go through this, we understand more deeply the, the person of Jesus Christ and the person of God the Father. Whether that we see the parables uh, for, for their purpose, what they were written for, why they were given to us, something concrete that we can go back to again and again and again. And so again, that, that'll, that'll be, that'll be the, the, the encouragement, the admonishment, the challenge, whatever that is we go through this, that we take those parables and we squeeze them for all they're worth, get all the juice out of them. Uh, and I thought of it this way. I think I've probably used this before in the past, but um, I thought of squirrels. You guys, you guys familiar with squirrels? Okay. Squirrels are, are, are wonderful little furry creatures, but they have a problem, right? You ever been driving down the road and a squirrel jumps out in front of you? Now, I have a rule when I'm driving. If it will go under my tires, I'm not going to swerve, right? And that sounds cruel, but I ain't putting the truck in the ditch for a squirrel. I might slow down. I might try to give them a little extra room. But here's the thing. Squirrel jumps out, and what do I mean? What do they do? They're like, okay? And they'll run, and then they run. You're like, okay, he's running off. And he stops. And then he turns around and comes back. You're like, what are you doing? I'm going to run you over. And I may not feel bad about it because you had your chance. Right? But, but they're like, <laughs> what is that? Our family says, Is that when they go like under your car as it goes up? Yeah, some squirrels, man, I, think, I think you're right. I think some of them are like timing it up. They're like licking their paws and they're, I don't know. But, but I think, think about it in this, this way with the parables. If you had an opportunity to roll, maybe roll your window down and you could speak to that squirrel and go, pick a side, get out of the way. And they go, oh, he's going to run me over. And they actually listened to you, and they actually went to safety. Would that not be something? It would be something. And I think about for us spiritually, I think sometimes we're like squirrels. We're in that middle of that, we don't know what's going on in life. Sometimes we get overwhelmed and we complicate things, and we're running back and forth. Right? And truth be told, we've got to get out of the way. The amazing thing is that God came, right? He spoke squirrel to us, okay? Or maybe, maybe we'll just say he, he's spoken words that we could understand, and he said things like the kingdom of heaven is like. And he said things like, you know, here's the, here's, here's where the, the bridegroom and the bride. We're going to talk about some of that one, right? He's going to talk about sons that get to come back home and fathers that forgive them. Right? We're going to talk about people who get taken care of, even though you know, you know, they didn't cause the problem. They got beat up and left, and the world kind of kicked them to the curb, and someone came along and took care of them. We're going to get to talk about simple stories that mean deep spiritual things that can steer us out of the way of trouble. Trouble in this lifetime and trouble for the life that is to come. 
And it's as if someone, again, rolls that window down and says, you need to go this way. You need to go here and do this. You need to know this. It will mean life to you. It will save you. It will rescue you. And that's exactly what the parables do for us. And so I hope as we go through it, we have that opportunity to hear it. Again, even though it's simple, and maybe we've heard it before, but to hear that, that truth, hey, that truth is for me. I'm going to take it. I'm going to run with it. Right? It's something I can put in my hands. It's concrete. And even though I, I haven't seen God, right? even though maybe I haven't audibly heard God, right? I have his works and I have his voice right here in this book, right? in the words of Christ and in these parables. And so again, my hope is, my challenge is that we'll take them and we'll let them work in our lives just as they were doing when Christ spoke them 2,000 years ago. Amen? If you would stand with me, we're going to close in just a simple quick time of prayer. I know there's a, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, sickness, so my, my wife is home with the flu, and so uh, here flying solo and uh, ask that you'd pray for her. I, I know for, for Karen and, the, and Chuck and the Cartuccio family that, that Brother Ron's in heaven, and, and all those parables make perfect sense to him now, right? If there's ever anything he didn't understand, he understands it now. He, he's in eternity with his Savior, but pray for the family. Encourage them this morning before you leave. It's hard to lose someone that you love. Um, again, I know a lot of things are going on, and life can seem very complicated at times, but maybe my encouragement this morning is to let the love of God, the encouragement of God, the grace of God be simple this morning. Just immerse yourself in it, right? I uh, already sang the song, Brother Todd already mentioned it. There is an ocean of grace available to us if we will just stop trying to tread water and just let ourselves sink into it. Uh, there's amazing peace and comfort in that, and it's hard to quit resisting but we've got to let the grace of God permeate our lives this morning uh, and hopefully maybe be excited for where God takes us studying some parables on Sunday morning. So we're going to have just a quick time of prayer. If you need me, I'm here uh, after that short time. We've got a few announcements and then we'll be dismissed this morning. So this time's for you. As we kind of ease into 2020, uh, family group starts back up tonight at the Seal Coffs. Uh, and so everyone's invited to come be a part of that, 5 o'clock. Uh, really, for 2020, one of the visions is that we do a lot more of that kind of fellowship. Uh, we're hoping to expand family groups, so wait for that information to come as well. But we would encourage people to get together. So Sunday nights, uh, for tonight, the Steel Coffs are opening their home, 5 o'clock. Uh, I think the main, kind of main dish is tacos, right? You can never go wrong with tacos, 
right? There's something spiritual about tacos and cheese dip, and so maybe if you want to bring something that goes along with that, uh, go and hang out. Um, unfortunately, I won't be there. We are quarantined. Uh, Kimmy has the flu, so pray for her. She's working on getting over that. Uh, but we, we value that time. We love that time to be with other people, and so I encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, and again, as we look to expand family group, be prepared for those kind of announcements. We're excited for that. Uh, a lot of things coming up. Our first big kind of service thing of the year outside of this place is our fifth Friday feed. So that's going to be January 31st. We'll be at Church in the Park. We're going to provide the meal. Already have people bringing food. Got people bringing uh, warm clothes to donate. So we're going to be sorting through all that, getting that ready. One of the biggest needs still is to have people who will just come and sit at a table and talk. Right? And, and honestly, you go, if, if you're kind of like me, you're like, I'm not a big talker. I'm not really a big extrovert. You don't really do a lot of talking. From what I, my memory of it, I went, I sat, and I just listened to someone talk for about an hour because they just needed to talk. They just needed someone who would look them in the eye and listen to what they had to say. And so maybe you're like, I don't know how to hold a conversation. Listen. If you can listen to someone and just be a, a shoulder to cry on or a listening ear for them, it's really what they need. They just need someone to listen. And so if you are willing to come be a part of that, I know some people have already signed up. Uh, my goal is to have a minimum of 12 people there. I would love to have about 20 people there. Okay, so pray for that. Can be a part of that. We'll leave here probably about 5 o'clock, take the food in there and get it ready. It officially starts at 6. By about 7.30, it's all wrapped up and done, and we're out of there. So you're taking one evening, you're out of this month, to go and invest in people. And so if you can be a part of that, be a part of it. All right, if you got questions, come find me or love to answer it. And we're going to do it again. So if you can't come be a part of it this time, we're going to do it every time there's a fifth Friday. It's at least four times this year. And we may pick up a couple extra weeks if they need us. So I'm excited for that as well. Men's dinner this Thursday night next door, 630. All right, we're going to have pizza. Uh, we're going to talk about missions and being on mission and things like that. I think we're going to have a guest speaker. Okay, so we're excited for that. Uh, and so all, all guys, all men, come be a part of that. Uh, eat some pizza. Listen to, to, to someone come and challenge us, encourage us to be out on mission. I think it will be a good time. And be praying for missions. Uh, my, my hope, my goal is for us as a church uh, to be on mission, preferably out of the state at some point this year, and begin the process of pursuing out-of-the-country missions. Uh, right? So we need some, some new, fresh stories about what God is doing outside of this United States, right? We got enough problems here. Let's go somewhere else and uh, help them, right? So it'll be good. We're excited for that. Okay. And we'll try to get all that information out as well. Uh, but again, keywords there, celebration of life. We get to honor Mr. Ron uh, and share some great memories. So that's going to be Saturday, 2 o'clock here. Perfect. All right, a lot of stuff going on. Check the app. I mean, we got Impact Weekend for the youth is coming up. Uh, I think uh, we, we got the first round of people signed up for men's and women's conferences. I know there's probably still some opening for men's. Women's is probably all booked up because uh, the women are better at going to that stuff than men, just to be honest. But men's conference is great. Be involved. Check that. If you got questions, let me know. If you have a need, contact me. Contact the deacons. Uh, we love to be able to serve and help where we can. Uh, and so, again, I know a lot of things going on. Uh, life gets complicated, but don't. Do it alone. Cool. Okay. Ladies' lunch on the 24th. It'll be somewhere, somewhere local. The Feast. Well, that sounds interesting. Okay. Is that in Midwest City? Where's that? Oh, okay. All right. Well, I might have to be a lady for a day. And go, no, I'm just kidding. Go to the Feast. All right. Sounds good. All right, again, if you have any questions or anything, please please contact me, let me know. Uh, let's get 2020 started off well. So let's, uh, if nothing else, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll, we'll close or pray our way out of here. We'll be dismissed. Nothing again, nothing else going on in the building for the rest of the evening, this afternoon, this evening. Home group, be a part of that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. I thank you for these folks. I thank you for our time to gather in your name. Thank you for uh, the songs that we get to sing. Father, may, again, the words that leave our lips be true and honest. I thank you for your word. Uh, Father, I thank you that you've made it simple uh, so simple people like me can understand it. But, Father, I thank you that those simple truths have such profound meaning in my life. And, Father, I pray that we would take the, the concrete examples you've given us, your word, your works, 
uh, and that we'd run with it. We, we, we'd know that you've made yourself known, you revealed yourself to us. We thank you for that. May we not walk in blindness or slavery anymore, Father. We thank you for the freedom that you offer. I pray for home group, and I pray for those that will be there, Father. I pray there will be a sweet time of fellowship. I pray for the different activities you've given us to be about, the service projects, that we do those, uh, Father, with, uh, again, excited hearts. We're ready to do it, excited to serve. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd bless those endeavors. And uh, Father, we thank you for being good to your children. You're, you're a good father to us. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.